Once when Jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say that I am? They answered, John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still other one of the ancient prophets has arisen. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered, The Messiah of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We had a lot of flyovers. We either have helicopters or airplanes or the crow that sits up here and squawks during the music and the sermon most Sundays that we've been out here. I'm going to wait just a moment. Talk amongst yourselves for a moment until this passes by. Okay, here we go. Those of you who are in the cars, I want you to flash your lights. And those of you who are sitting outside, raise your hands. Which speaks louder, actions or words? Raise your hand or flash your lights if you think your actions speak louder than your words. Anybody here think your words speak louder than your actions? Nobody. Okay. Let's talk about that a little bit. We have a story that follows this morning from Acts that follows the action. The action being the healing of the man who was born unable to walk. If you were here last week or you saw the service online, we read the story from the third chapter of Acts. And this is one of those things that doesn't show up in the lectionary, but I think it's one of the most powerful stories in all of Scripture. And I think we need to talk about it. There was a man who was born unable to walk, which meant he couldn't go to the temple, he couldn't work, he couldn't have a family. He really had no life and was not living inside the law because of his living circumstances. And he begged every day at the beautiful gate. John and Peter walk by him. They stop. He thinks he's going to get a coin from them. And instead they say, we have no gold, we have no silver, but what we give you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. The man stands up and walks and the people are amazed. We read that part last week. Seems like an action, doesn't it, that speaks very loudly of who Peter is now with the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's go back and look at the Gospel because the Gospel happens quite a bit before what we read from Acts this morning. Jesus is with his disciples. The crowds are not there, but they have seen him heal. They've seen him teach. They've seen miracles. They can't believe the things they've seen, but now it's just Jesus and the Twelve. And he says to them, who do people say that I am? You heard the answers. Some say John the Baptist. Because this was not long after John had been killed by King Herod. There were those who thought perhaps he had been the Messiah, the expected one, the one they had longed for for so many, many generations in Israel. And they thought maybe John was been resurrected in Jesus. Others said Elijah. Now Elijah is the great prophet of the Old Testament. Elijah did not die per se. What happened to Elijah? Do you remember? Swing low, sweet chariot. Chariot of fire comes down from heaven, swoops him up and takes him off. And to this day, if you're ever blessed enough to be invited to a Jewish family Seder celebration of Passover, there is a beautiful place setting left for Elijah because his return, they believe, will happen to foreshadow the coming of the Messiah. So some of the crowd thought Jesus perhaps was Elijah. Then the others said, well, they just think you're one of those great number of prophets of old the prophets of God who spoke truth to power in so many circumstances. They approached the Pharaoh. They approached the kings, the righteous ones and the unrighteous ones. They approached even David, was approached by the prophet Nathan to tell him that he had been unfaithful to God and confronted him with his own sin, and David repented and turned again to God. Prophets had power, and they always had powerful words that were given to them by God alone to speak. And so this is what the crowds are saying. This may be who this man Jesus is. But then he looks at Peter and he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, as he always does, blurts out an answer. The first thing that comes to his mind, and this time he's absolutely right. You are the Messiah of God. You are the one that God has anointed. You're the one that we have been promised. You're the one we've been waiting for for all these years. You're the one who's going to redeem Israel. You're the one who's going to restore us to the kingdom, restore us to power in the land of promise because they still yet did not understand what Jesus' kingdom was all about. It was not about who had control of Jerusalem. And so Peter gets the answer right. So this is a passage where your words have power, amen. But then he gets it wrong, because what do we see Peter doing? A time and time again, 
He'll get it right only to get it wrong again. Peter, right after the passage where he proclaims Jesus as Messiah, is taken up the mountain with John again to the time of Jesus' transfiguration. And before them, who appears but Elijah, who we just spoke of, Moses, the giver of the law, Elijah, the great prophet. And Peter is so fascinated by the moment that he says, what should we do? Should we build a house so we can all stay here? God has to say, oh, Peter, hush up and listen to my son. We see Peter trying to walk on water because Jesus calls him from the boat, and he gets up and goes. I give him great credit for that. But as soon as he steps upon the waves and he starts to walk, something happens. He starts to lose focus on Jesus, and he says, people can't do this. And what happens? He sinks. But then there is no worse moment for Peter than after at the dinner, the night Jesus has washed their feet, they've shared a last meal with him, Jesus tells them what's going to happen, and Peter says, no matter what anyone else does, Lord, I will follow you to the end. I will not abandon you. Jesus says, oh, Peter, 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 Satan's going to sift you like wheat, and you're going to come up lacking. And Peter, who had promised to love Jesus and follow him and stay with him no matter what, denies even knowing him three times. Those are words with some power. Those are actions that do not match his proclamation to his God. But then Jesus is raised from the dead. They're still locked in a room, but then Jesus ascends on high, and the promised Holy Spirit is poured into them, and they cannot be stopped, and they can no longer be quiet. They're out of hiding, which is why Peter and John go to the temple that day, and they see this man, a son of Abraham, and they say, we don't have gold, we don't have silver, but what we give you, what we have we give you. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up and walk. We left the story there last week, but the story gets a lot more complicated as we read into the third chapter and into the fourth. Because they are standing in the midst of people from Jerusalem. Good Jews, because you have to be a good Jew to be at the temple ready to pray at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. These are devout folks. It's a mixed crowd, Pharisees and Sadducees. They've known this man forever. They've known him since he was born. They knew him as a child. They've watched him every day begging at the temple. They know he could not walk. This isn't a shill out in the audience who is there to prove that someone has the power of healing. This is a man that they knew could not walk, and suddenly, by the words spoken to him, he stands up, he walks, he leaps, he praises God, and they're amazed. Great story. But then, as they stand there in their amazement, Peter decides to go from actions to words again. And his words have great power. They have the power to really inflame the crowd. He blows up the room. Because what does he do? But he looks at them and says, don't think for a moment that this is some magic act. Don't think for a moment that we have any power to heal. This man was healed. This man that you knew could not walk is up and walking and praising and jumping and screaming and shouting and saying hallelujah because of Jesus of Nazareth. And then he turns to them and he says, the one that you killed, the one that you denied. Pilate would have set him free. This isn't about Rome. This is about you. Pilate wanted to free him, but no, you wanted Barabbas the murderer instead. You have done this. And Christ was raised from the dead, and they are really, really getting a little ticked off at this point. Now, this is a joke that I heard in seminary, but I probably heard it in Bible studies before then, and probably heard it in VBS even before that. The crowd was mixed. There were Sadducees and Pharisees. Everyone sort of lumps them together. They had some very distinct differences, and one was their understanding of the resurrection. The Pharisees did believe that there would be a resurrection from the dead. The Sadducees were a, found that to be an abhorrent notion. They did not believe in the resurrection. They denied the resurrection, and that is why they're sad, you see? So you ever need to remember that. That's the way to remember. The Sadducees deny the resurrection. And imagine them standing there listening, these devout Jews who have gone to the temple at 3 o'clock. You've got to be devout to stop every day and go at that time to pray. And what does he say to them? He said, this is the one that God has promised. This is the Messiah of God, the one you killed. But we know that you were ignorant of these things. That's like saying to a seminary professor, I'm sorry, you just don't understand scripture. That was a real insult to the people listening. Or if any of you decided to jump up some Sunday during a sermon and say, I'm sorry, you have no idea what you're talking about, Rev. That kind of affront to the crowd listening. And Peter continues to speak. And this is one of those cases where sometimes your words need to be as loud as your actions. 
granted, they need to be consistent. We've been confronted with a lot lately, the pandemic, the economic crisis, and what's going on in terms of the unrest in our country over racial divisions. And I think this is the time for us not just to speak, but to act, and not just to act, but to speak. We're going to talk about this for a few weeks because we're going to look at ways that we can together work to dismantle racism in the country. And again, this is not an accusation. It's an invitation to change the world in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth who calls those who cannot walk to walk, who calls those who are dead back to life. We have a chance to do something with our words and with our actions as well. And right now, some of us are relying on our actions I can't tell you how many people have said to me, I have never owned a slave. I think, well, I know you have not owned a slave. Some people say, I love all people. I understand that you love all people. I have never been disrespectful to anyone. I've never used racial epithets. I've never said anything hurtful. And that's good, because those are actions that show your love. I have seen Epworth's love in action. I have seen your commitment to mission. I've seen your love for each other in our prayer concerns. I've seen your welcome to anyone who walks in the door, regardless of who they are or what they've been in the past or what race or gender they are. You welcome everyone lovingly, and those are good actions. But just as Peter spoke boldly when he was with Jesus and the disciples alone on that hillside, it's easy to speak boldly in here, isn't it, about Christ. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Easy to say in here, isn't it? Not as easy to say in the world. Not as easy to live in the world. But when a United Methodist is baptized or confirmed or joins the church, we promise with all that we have and all that we are to love Jesus Christ with everything in us. And we promise to confront injustice and oppression in whatever forms they take. And so I invite you to join with me in remembering those in our own communities who suffer because of prejudice, bigotry, and racism, so that together we can stand and do something different. One of the great heroes in my faith journey, and I used to have his picture over my desk along with Mother Teresa and Dietrich Bonhoeffer and St. Francis of Assisi. Not a photograph of him, but a painting of him, and I have a little statue of him in my office right now. But Martin Luther King Jr. was one of the great inspirations for me. I remember hearing his sermons when I was a child, and I really think the preacher in him was talking to the little growing preacher inside of me that had yet to fully understand her call. And I remember reading this story about a knight. Do you know that Martin Luther King Jr. never wanted to be the leader of a movement? He had no intention of doing anything but being a pastor. He served as a young man a fairly affluent congregation, an African-American congregation. He was happy being a pastor. He didn't see himself as a prophet. He didn't want to do that. And then he got a call that said, as he began to become involved with the movement, that if he wasn't out of town in three days, that his family was going to be killed. This was a young man with a wife and a new baby daughter upstairs, and a Molotov cocktail had been thrown through their living room window. And he could not sleep, and he was at the table at night asking, just as Jesus had done, to let this pass from him. He wanted no parts of this. And he later admitted that he was scared and paralyzed by fear, but he felt something happen in him that night. And he writes about it in his autobiography, and he says, there comes a point in your faith life when the faith of your daddy is no longer good enough. You've got you to gotta own it yourself. You have to absorb it and internalize it. And he heard a voice speak to him that said, stand up for righteousness, stand up for justice, stand up for truth, and lo, I will be with you even until the end of the world. And the voice said, I will never leave you never leave you alone, no, never alone, no, never alone. That was an experience of Christ that changed his life so that his words and his actions became powerful, powerful ways of people transforming their lives because God was with him in the kitchen to say, I won't leave you alone. And I'm sure the day that he was killed, God was with him. We have a duty as the people of Jesus Christ to act in ways according to our faith. But we need to find our voice as well. We need to call out injustice and oppression where we see them. We need to stand with our neighbors, our brothers and sisters of every color and every persuasion on this planet. 
We need to make Christ real because Christ will never leave us or forsake us. He will never leave us or forsake us. No, never alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. So I invite anyone who is up to going this afternoon to go with me to a rally. It's a peaceful rally. Or to find ways in your own world. We're going we're gonna to have some times where I'm going to invite you all to some discussions on how we can make things change in the world. One of my neighbors, his name is Kelly Bell, and some have heard of him because he has a blues band in Baltimore. He's one of the sweetest neighbors I've ever had, and he has invited me to take part in a conversation that is posted on Facebook with his good friend Edwin McCain, who is a singer of some renown. He hasn't had a top ten hit in about 20 years, but he, was, he had several, and you probably heard him his music, if you don't even recognize his name. But Kelly is black and Edwin is white. And every Wednesday they broadcast a conversation about race. They invite their neighbors and their friends to come in. They've invited me to appear with them in a couple weeks to talk about the faith perspective on this. Not to accuse anyone, but to equip others to have some honest and open conversations about how we can change the world. For us, that's to change the world in the name of Jesus Christ. That's for us to find a way to listen to the voice who says, we don't have gold or silver, but we can tell you that Jesus will have you stand and walk. So I'm going to tell you when I appear with them, and I'm going to invite you to some other conversations so that together we might proclaim Christ with actions and with words that speak power, trusting that God will never leave us alone. The power of the Holy Spirit poured out at Pentecost has made all this possible. It changed Peter. It can change us if we're just open to that promise and that power that he will never leave us alone. Never alone. No, never alone. Amen.